everyone, you're listening to Intersections of Public Service, the Weldon Cooper podcast created by UVA students and staff that takes a look at pressing issues in our community, how public servants address them, and what you can do to help. I'm your host, Claire Downey. So, have you ever been sitting around at home thinking about how civility, passports, and Dracula all relate to each other? No? Well, if not, then buckle up for a wild ride, because in this episode, I will be interviewing Ipshika Takur, who is a PhD plus student that has partnered with the Cooper Center while doing research for her doctorate degree. So just some background, the PhD plus program is run by UVA, and it pairs PhD students with different partners of the University of Virginia. Thanks for joining me today, Deepshika. Thank you for having me here. So you are a part of the PhD plus program. Mm -hmm. at UVA, and you're working in tandem with the Weldon Cooper Center. I am. So could you introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about your role here and what you're up to? Absolutely. So I'm a fourth-year PhD student at the Department of English in the University of Virginia, and I'm working with Meredith and Larry here to create a document on the contemporary practices of civility and how uh, sort of what we expect when we think of someone as being civil and how those things affect things like political campaigns, everyday interactions within an organization and our social life and public engagement in general. For those of you that are unfamiliar with the Cooper Center, Meredith Gunter is the Director of Strategy and Public Engagement, and Larry Terry is the Executive Director of the Cooper Center. Essentially, they work closely with all of our different departments to best ensure that the Cooper Center is fulfilling their greater goals of providing the best public service that we possibly can. Naturally, civility within public service then makes a lot of sense. What is civility? Would you be able to define that for me? I can tell you that lots of people have lots of different definitions. Okay. The most consistent aspect of all of these definitions is that civility is civility is the act of expecting people to treat you like you treat them and there being an extension of trust and respect when you do that. So you trust and respect people and you expect people to do that, to extend that to you in return. Okay. So maybe if you're violent towards others, you probably wouldn't. Expect them to be civil back to you? Yeah. Um, No, I don't think so. And also (laughs) going back to the history of the idea, everyone, or at least most advocates of civility have had groups that they did not include within within that sort of magical circle. And um, John Locke, for instance, did not think that anyone should be civil to atheists and heretics, <laughs> even if those people were civil to them. So, you know, hmm. everyone has their limits. Side note, for those of you that haven't been in a high school government class recently, John Locke was an English philosopher from the Enlightenment era who largely inspired the founding fathers when they were writing the Declaration of Independence. Could you tell me about the PhD Plus program? Yes, absolutely. So the PhD Plus program is conducted by UVA and it's working with the Weldon Cooper Center to offer PhD students at the University of Virginia experience outside their dissertation outside their research and it's sort of it's a way for PhD students at University of Virginia to experience kind of a a professional work environment that is maybe not necessarily academic Mm -hmm. and learn things from that so I was very interested in advocacy and experience at nonprofit organizations and that's why I'm here at the Weldon Cooper Center and it's been so lovely. That's awesome. In terms of doing advocacy nonprofit work here how does that kind of fit into what you're researching about well so i'm currently doing my dissertation on the gothic and borders <laughs> which are two very different things and often seem to people to be a surprising combination of concepts i think talking about borders and talking about how we engage with them is largely a conversation about how we, how we form part of our nations, how we form part of our communities. And I think that ties back very well with the idea of public service and understanding how a community functions so you can help and be part of that community in a better way. And I feel like that's what this PhD plus experience has been about, learning how to do that. So I would say that is the way in which my dissertation or my PhD research and my work here has kind of converged. 
So it's kind of taking all of those interests mm -hmm. and putting them into one experience. Absolutely, yes. And how do you feel like that's helped you in your work? Well, for one thing, I have become better, I think, than before in explaining my work to people who are outside the academic community. The other thing I've had to do is explain my research in terms of how it might help people who are not interested in the research itself or in the PhD itself in understanding their world better, which is what I ultimately want to do with my research. I want it to be out there as a tool for people to understand their world better. Let's go on a journey Absolutely. of your research, all right? <laughs> so you're here at UVA. Mm -hmm. How did you start the topic that you're currently researching? Did someone advise you on it? Did you pick it yourself? Well, so I have always been interested in borders just because I have been a migrant for a very long time. I'm a first generation migrant. I left my home country when I was 19. And since then I have lived, I've lived in England. Then I went back to India for a year and now I'm here for my PhD. I've always been very interested in figuring out how crossing borders works for specific people and how the experience is different depending on which community you're from, what kind of passport you hold, what kind of privileges you have and what kind of laws you're subject to. So after I came to the UVA, my department, I already knew I was interested in it. So I approached people who are now my professors who are now my advisors and together we figured out a way to put my questions and my curiosities into a project and at least try to arrive at a better understanding of how border crossing works. My dissertation is very particularly interested in the idea of the transnational Gothic. I think the most succinct way to explain it is to say that in 21st century novels, in 21st century literature, a thing happens a kind of writing, a kind of um, thematic work happens, which adapts the tropes, motives, and conventions of 18th and 19th century Gothic literature to explore the fears and the anxieties that surround everyday, the everyday reality of border crossings, of migration, of transnational identity formations. Hmm. So that is the concept that I'm looking at. And I'm examining the possibility and hopefully the reality on, of this concept through four works. And those are my chapters. Okay. So what is it about Gothic literature in particular that makes it a good example to look at that type of well, so, theme? So here's the funny thing. Uh, we think of Gothic literature largely as a matter of vampires and zombies and um, things coming at you in the night and uh, being very suspenseful. Gothic is all of that. However, Gothic, right from the beginning, has also been very interested in talking about things that other people did not want to talk about or repressed, or a better way to put it is Gothic is very interested in talking about repressed anxieties. Hmm. Even in the 19th century, immigration was one such anxiety. Mm -hmm. I always like to point out that Gothic has been interested in immigration right from the start. So think of Dracula, for instance. Bram Stoker's really famous really popular novel. Um, we think of Dracula in our popular imagination largely as a vampire who preys on young women. And we think of him as someone who is sort of a lone figure who is permanently, a, you know, he, he always creates fear no matter where he is. But the truth is, if you go back to Stoker's novel, if you read the novel very carefully, you will realize that Dracula only becomes monstrous. Dracula only becomes a source of fear when he meets a British man, when he meets Jonathan Harker. Jonathan Harker goes to visit him in Transylvania because Count Dracula wants to buy property in London. Hmm. He wants to cross the border between his place and England, and he wants to set, he wants to settle down in London. It is his plan to settle down in London. It is his plan to prey on British women specifically that creates anxiety, that creates the fear. 
in Transylvania, <laughs> Count Dracula is um, is a given. Is, is everyone knows what he is? He is a terrible landlord. He's a predator, but he's certainly not <laughs> a sinister monstrosity that um, kind of hides in the metropolis. I just like framing Dracula as just a really bad <gasps> landlord. That, well, that's you know. really funny. <laughs> Well, yeah. If you if you're villagers, if if you have a massive mansion slash manor and mm-hmm. all the peasants are afraid of you, then yeah, you're probably a terrible landlord. That's kind <laughs> of given. You're like awful gentry, and yeah. he is that. But it's only when he comes to London. Funnily enough, he stops being Count Dracula. Mm. He becomes. He describes himself in the words, "a stranger in a strange land." Mm. He's just a stranger. And that's the problem. No one knows what to expect of him. He's an immigrant and he poses a danger. That's when Dracula becomes the subject of this novel. So the Gothic has always been, you know, interested in what happens when you cross borders. Okay, so would you be able to define Gothic? Is it a time frame of literature that it's written in? Is it a specific type of theme? Is it a time frame with a specific type of theme? So, as you probably know, it started out as a style of architecture. Right. Then it got associated with a specific kind of writing. It started in the late 18th century. It continues to this day. People have defined the Gothic in very different ways. Mm. Fred Botting, who's known as, who's like a very well-respected theorist of the Gothic, calls it a writing of excess. He doesn't talk about the supernatural in his definition. The the Hmm. one line, the very pithy summary is that it's a writing of excess. Writing of excess. What does that mean? It means it's transgressive. Whatever talks about blood and gore and death and destruction and hidden things and nightmares. Hmm. It's writing that that deals with things that basically no one wants to talk about. Uh. (laughs) That's the gothic. Um... Other people have referred to Gothic as parts of a novel you don't want to think about. If you're a mm. 19th century, um, if you're not, if you are a specialist of 19th century literature, you don't want to necessarily say you're studying the Gothic. You want to say you're studying 19th century literature that has Gothic bits, and this is because the Gothic has been seen as a lowbrow form of literature for a very long time. I wanted to do a little more research on why Gothic was considered a lowbrow form of literature at the time. So according to ThoughtCo, Gothic literature is defined as a writing that employs dark and picturesque scenery, startling and melodramatic narrative devices, and an overall atmosphere of exoticism, mystery, fear, and dread. Gothic is actually a subset of romantic literature, not to be confused with romantic novels, so no Fabios allowed. Think romantic is in 18th century literature valuing sensationalist storytelling with outlandish plot lines of grand knights on adventurous journeys. So gothic literature is basically like the moody cousin of romantic literature, who mostly focuses on darkness and anxiety. They both have a little flair for drama, you might say. Gothic literature started during the late 1700s in Europe and hit the ground running in the 1800s. Think Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or Phantom of the Opera. Now, the reason why Gothic literature is considered lowbrow is because right after the Romantic period came a movement of literary realism in the mid-19th century. Ushered in by the Industrial Revolution, realism focuses on the objective reality much more than the -the over-the-top flamboyance of Romantic literature. So basically, realistic literature scoffed in the corner while Romantic literature performed a self-indulgent ribbon dance. So, um, the answer is, the Gothic is many, many different things. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. But they're all dark and stormy. Uh-huh. So it's kind of that common tie of really big black boots. I maybe? would definitely go with the big black boots because I wear them all the time. Oh, I was going to say, I just bought a pair. So there you go. We're, we're all a little gothic mm-hmm. in our own ways. Your research kind of encompasses a lot of different types of literature. Mm-hmm. Would you be able to go into what books specifically you've been looking at? Yeah. So actually, my research has been very specific in the kind of literature it looks at. It looks at um, global contemporary novels. And the four books I'm looking at are Helen Oyeyemi's Why It Is For Witching, Salman Rushdie's Shalimar the Clown, Han Kang's The Vegetarian, and finally Juno Diaz's The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wao. Out of these, The Vegetarian is a translation from Korean. 
the other three are global anglophone texts and what does global anglophone mean it means that the texts are written in english they were composed in english but they they are not necessarily part of what we would consider british or american literature okay so written in english mm-hmm. not necessarily written by english people yes okay uh, mm-hmm. gotcha would you be able to tell me a little bit about how those books tie into talking about borders specifically yeah absolutely so in all four books there is a massive emphasis on the supernatural or the unnatural as a way of talking about other things which ties into the gothic part exactly all right very briefly the brief wondrous life of oscar wow has a has this trope of a curse called the fuku americanus which comes like a storm and destroys people everywhere and it is seen as a curse that arose out of colonialism but it is a curse it is about you know it is about a magical trope and it is being used as a device of horror so i'm looking at that Helen Oyeyemi's book is about a racist haunted house. <laughs> then there is uh, Shalimar the Clown, which features the idea of a woman being declared dead and then her coming back to her village. And also th- and also the idea of her then living with her actually dead mother. Ooh. So she she is declared dead because she betrayed her husband and left her community. Mm. They declare her dead as a punishment. However, when she comes back to this community and starts living in a forest outside it because she's not allowed in, she's protected by her mother, who is at this point actually a ghost. So there's that. Right. <laughs> That's pretty gothic. Um, the vegetarian is, I like to call it, my problem text. It's the one where these boundaries are much more fluid. The vegetarian doesn't really... The vegetarian doesn't really deal with ghosts instead it dream it deals with very violent dreams and it's about the idea of haunting but not haunting but not getting haunted by ghosts rather getting haunted by past selves or getting haunted by the idea of things one has done which in the case of vegetarian is the idea of meat eating so um yeah that's pretty gothic in terms of border crossing so Helen Oyeyemi's book involves a woman leaving her home in Dover, England for Haiti and getting killed there and how her racist ancestral home deals with the fact that its heiress left and got killed somewhere else. Hmm. And that's the White is for Witching? That is White is okay. for Witching. Um, Shalimar the Clown involves this woman, Bunyi, leaving her country, her community in Kashmir and traveling to America. And it's about what repercussions that border crossing has on a lot of people and what kind of anxieties it ultimately activates. Brief Wondrous, of, uh, Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Rao is about the Dominican American, uh, the Dominican American experience and what it means to sort of have a transnational identity that you know, creates its complications in a land where as it's seen as a complication at times. So it's about that. And finally, the vegetarian does not actually involve a border crossing in the text, which is really odd. But I have kept this book in my research because I'm very interested in the way that vegetarian, a book about sort of bordering on supernatural, but not really that kind of horror, got translated. And as a book left its country, the text, the the story doesn't leave Korea, but the book, The Vegetarian, left Korea and it got turned into, it, it, it was translated into English and it, it became very popular and it has now kind of traveled the world and activated its own reading practices that sometimes see gothic where the author didn't mean for there to be gothic. So mm-hmm. I'm talking about that. And, and that's from Korea? Mm-hmm. That's so interesting. I'm assuming South Korea. Yes, South Korea. Absolutely. Okay. And I don't know if you know this or not. Is that like a commonly vegetarian? It's actually the opposite. Okay. It, there's a lot of um, the norm in South Korea is definitely meat eating. Okay. And um, one of the things that I have had to come to terms with as a reader, and this is why I'm interested in talking about the gothic of reading a book at a different place to where it was created, is the fact that um, 
as a woman born to a caste Hindu family, I have always been exposed to a world where being vegetarian is associated with purity and it's associated with um, caste hierarchy and mm. dynamics of power. People get lynched in India for consuming beef. So it was very strange reading a book where vegetarianism is a revolutionary act mm -hmm. and it is vegetarianism that lands her in so much trouble and, you know, endangers her life. And in reading this book from my own identity position, it became very clear to me that the, that the gothic doesn't lie in vegetarianism or meat eating. It lies in pervasiveness of norms and our relationship with consumption, what we eat and what kind of things we read and all, all kinds of consumption. So what I was doing when I was reading The Vegetarian was kind of approaching a text in conditions that were not present, in reading conditions that were not intended when it was written. Mm -hmm. I was reading it as someone who grew up in a society where vegetarianism, where in particular ritual vegetarianism, not ethical, not environmental vegetarianism, and I need to be very clear on this, ritual religious vegetarianism is prized above many things. I was reading a book about a culture where meat eating is the sign of belonging. What was very interesting to me is the act of that reading and how, for me, the text became quite scary and quite incomprehensible at first and quite disturbing because of that clash between the person who was reading it and the culture in which it was written. And I think that's a very good thing. Those kinds of clashes should happen and people should engage with that difference. So that kind of like helps you read it closer mm -hmm. because there isn't that automatic cultural assumption of, oh, I understand this because this Absolutely. is a norm in my country. You can kind of deconstruct it in a way that's farther away from the intention. Absolutely. And yeah. I think we should all read literature from cultures that are, uh, you know, that are different from ours. We should constantly do this. It's a good practice. Yeah. And it teaches you more about other people's perspectives Absolutely. as well. So now that we're on the subject of reading, mm -hmm. I was curious about your research methods. Mm -hmm. So your research is reading literature. Correct. Well, that is a huge part of it, yes. I part. also do a lot of work on historical contexts and putting things both at the places where they were meant to be and also taking them out, like I said, and putting them in new environments. So, yeah. All right. So that's that's good to know. So you're just reading a lot. So how do you turn reading into research? You turn reading into research by rereading, by reading with attention and diligence and just not just seeing a text as a story, but seeing a text as language. So you have to look at, I always like to think of it as reading a text for three things, sonic, semantic and syllabic values by which I mean you have to read the text for what it means which is the semantic aspect you have to read the text for how it sounds and how it presents itself so the aesthetic qualities of the language and part of this is the syllabic so if you're reading poetry you need to learn what meter it's in what kind of prosody goes into it so that is reading for research I think the thing that distinguishes what I do from people who read for pleasure lies largely in rereading. Mm. I have to constantly reread the works that I study, that I write on. Whereas when I'm reading a 19th century novel for fun, I will usually read it one time and then maybe come back to it the next year. But there isn't this obsessive attention to every word, every syllable, every plot line, every avenue of meaning making. It is that which distinguishes reading for research from other kinds of reading. How do you take your research from all of these novels mm -hmm. after rereading and rereading and rereading and then apply that to your thesis? Do you take notes? Do you have like a master list of things that you want to tie in? How do you like collect all that data mm -hmm. from your readings and then put that into your thesis? So you made the process sound very, very elegant, like taking notes and then putting it into a master list. The truth is, it's very messy. <laughs> the truth is, it involves reading, forgetting to take notes sometimes, um, cursing, going back, taking notes, and um, 
writing chapters individually. So th- there cannot be a kind of master. The master document is the thesis itself, but one doesn't usually write it as a master document from beginning to end. I'm sure there are brilliant people on earth who do that. Unfortunately, I'm not one of them. I start by approaching one text and then uh, secondary texts that I have nominated that would go well with it, that tell me more about the text. And then I write, I write, I write. Writing is a pretty self-hating process. You (laughs) stare at a blank screen a lot. And then you get the words out somehow you get your thoughts out you make them cohere and in terms of your overall work Mm -hmm. would you be able to summarize the idea that you have about how these cultural norms that come out of these gothic novels within border crossing applies to today's politics or the news i think it's very important to sort of flag the fact that borders in the 21st century in the last five years have become very much a talking point. So we have the National Register of Citizenship in India. We have Brexit, which is an exercise in, you know, standing for the nation and rejecting um, supranational identities like the EU. We have, I mean, President Trump in his speech at the UN pointed out that he feels that people should stand for their nations and nationalism and reject globalism. I feel like there is a shrinking in the world. Um, There is a need to stand by borders. I mean, we have concentration camps that are created to defend borders. So a lot of people clearly feel anxious about borders and they feel that they're not being defended properly, they're not being enforced properly, and there's this sense that borders need to be as closed as possible. One of the questions I often face from people when I talk to them about my research is, am I an advocate for open borders? And I always find it very hard to answer the question. But I think I've recently made some effort and had some success in redefining the terms of the question for myself. So U.S. citizens can travel to 183 countries without a visa. That's a huge part of the world. On the contrary, other places like people from Afghanistan or people from Sierra Leone can't access that kind of freedom at all. So the the fact of the matter is that borders are open Borders are already open if you belong to certain countries. If you belong to countries like Japan, Singapore, United States of America, Britain, you have that freedom. So when people ask about open borders, and this is increasingly becoming a rallying question of our time, are you a believer in open borders or closed borders? The answer is, are we a believer in equal borders for all? or open borders from some and closed borders for others? I think that is the question that we need to answer. Yeah, that is a very good question because how can you create an equal border if there's this fear that's instilled Mm -hmm. against specific races, nationalities, religions, etc.? Do you have any idea of the kind of solution you would come up with or is that just something you've thought about a lot? I think the solution is for partly for all of us individually to educate ourselves and learn more about the things that are affecting people in other places so we can be better allies, we can be more sympathetic, and we can come from things from a position of information rather than prejudice. That's, for me, the most important bit. My research simply looks at the history, the genealogy, and why we feel this anxiety. I think that is my biggest question. Why are we so anxious about people from other cultures being in our lands? I have a personal stake in this because I am a migrant. I'm often in other people's homes, both literally and metaphorically. And these people are my friends, and I care very much about them. And I think I can say with some certainty, these people care about me. So when I see people being so anxious about the idea of meeting people from other places or them settling down next to us, I'm very curious about where that comes from. So where do you think that fear comes from? Just to ask the question you are just stating. I think it comes from the lack of knowledge. 
I think it comes from ignorance. If you don't know something, it is it is reasonable to be afraid of it. And I think what is reasonable changes with access to greater knowledge. It was reasonable at one point to think we had humors that we got ill because there was a because we had a bad balance in all the liquids in our bodies. <laughs> We don't think that anymore. We don't have ghosts in our bones. <laughs> yeah, because it was once reasonable to consider that women went mad because their womb went up. People had all sorts of... His- so the word hysteria comes from husteros, which means womb. I very much feel that we have had beliefs that were held, that were considered reasonable by large communities of people. But that idea of re- what is reasonable changed with more information. Mm-hmm. So I think what needs to happen is we need to, I think all of us, we just need to engage more with other cultures or even people who live with us in our countries that we may not care about, know very well. The first step is to find out more about them. The first step is to understand what these people care about, what informs their lives and what matters to them. Mm -hmm. And I think coming from that place of knowledge, the fear is less gripping Mm -hmm. and the ethic of care, the ethic of a common future for the planet becomes more obvious. And I think that kind of beautifully ties into the goal of the Walden Cooper Center. Yay. Yay, full circle. Because we're trying to create an organization that serves everyone. Exactly. Through public service. And how do you go about doing that if you don't even know who it is that you're serving and what they exactly. need? Exactly. So I love that. And the other thing is... I know I focused on individual action and individual education here a lot, but I would like to end on the note that nothing beats collective action. Meet up with people who believe in the same things that you have come to believe in on the basis of information, on the basis of reading and learning, and work with them, collaborate. And this brings us back to civility. If we want a positive definition of civility that doesn't just end in this idea of you know being polite with people then it's about collaboration it's about collaboration and getting together for meaningful reasons and we need to be able to do that if we want change so much from this episode about the social construct of borders, gothic literature, and what civility actually means. Civility can best be achieved through understanding, which means that in order to be civil, you must be open to listening to other people's perspectives. Easy enough, right? One of the many ways to do this by Deepshika's recommendation was by reading books written by authors that have a different perspective than your own. Towards the end of our discussion, I asked her for some book recommendations about borders. We will be putting all of the books discussed in this podcast in the episode description in case you ever want to see if they're at your local library or bookstore. Apart from the books, Deepshika also recommended a website called Words Without Borders. So I decided to look it up to see what it was, and the about page reads, Words Without Borders expands cultural understanding through the translation, publication, and promotion of the finest contemporary international literature. Our publications and programs open doors for readers of English around the world to the multiplicity of viewpoints, richness of experience, and literary perspective on world events offered by writers in other languages. We seek to connect international writers to the general public, to students and educators, and to the media to serve as a primary online location for global literary conversation. So basically, if you want to expand your knowledge of the world by tenfold, you can go to this website and find articles that pique your interest. Again, that website is called wordswithoutborders.org and it will also be listed in the episode description. I hope you got to learn something new today. So if you like this podcast, please share with your family and friends. And just to reiterate an important point that Deepshika made, knowledge is key to growing your understanding, but if you also want to take action on something you feel passionate about, find a community that also cares. If you love dogs, you can donate dog food, the SPCA. If you're passionate about affordable housing, you can go volunteer at Habitat for Humanity. There's so many different ways that you can help the community, so just remember, you don't have to work in public service to be a public servant.